Jim and Pam, would you mind standing for a minute? I feel like the, the Lord has something for you today. I, 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 just, I just sense his favor, even like a fresh outpouring of his favor and grace upon your lives. You guys have walked through some stuff. And, and it hasn't always been easy. And, and I, I feel like God is bringing you into a new season that, that's, that's going to be, there will be times when you're going to say, this seems too easy. This, this seems too easy. And, and it's actually the Lord coming on you and, and just releasing it. And I, I see you impacting other couples, particularly younger couples that are beginning to walk through stuff God, God has deposited in you wisdom to share with them that will be actually kingdom strategy for their lives. So don't be surprised when, when someone asks you, Jim, if some guy, younger guy asks you, or, or Pam, some younger lady asks you, just recognize that this is the Lord. You know, he, he wants me to share and, and release wisdom into their lives. So I, I just see this, this new season that you're coming into. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Does anybody have any problems in the right foot? It, it's it's like a, it's almost like a like a spasm, muscular type thing. Um, it, it, sometimes it feels almost like a, a bruising. When I was a kid, I used to jump off of things and I, I would land on my feet and I, I would bruise my feet sometimes and, and, it, and it was very uncomfortable. I, is that anybody that's right here? Is that you, Jim? Okay, you're right? Okay, uh, can, I, can I pray for you? I'm going to have you just come up here. And, and I want, Mickey, can you come too? How long has it been bothering you? Okay. Uh huh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Why don't you sit down? No, it's all right. No, you don't have to take your boot up. So, Father, we just release your healing power right now in the name of Jesus. We command that whatever is the source of this pain, we command it to be healed. We speak to nerves, muscles, ligaments, and tendons, and we command you to begin to function normally in Jesus' name. We just command this foot to begin to, to function by the way you designed it, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now what, why don't you just check it? And I don't... So what, did you not feel it when you were coming up, per se? Okay, okay. Then let us know. Do, do you have to be riding your motorcycle to tell? No. Oh, okay, just check it. Thank you for letting us pray for you. I'm anxious to hear, hear, the, hear the testimony about that. Well, if you've got a Bible today, could you look up 2 Timothy chapter 1? I, I've got some... Uh, I started reading these last Sunday, how children perceive parents. So I want to read this, um, how, how children perceive their grandparents. Have you, how many grandparents are here? Do you, you like ever wonder how they think of you all the time? <laughs> well, there's some back there, you can ask them. A grandmother was telling her little granddaughter what her own childhood was like. We used to skate outside on a pond. I had a swing made from a tire. It hung from a tree in our front yard. We rode our pony. We picked wild raspberries in the woods. The, the little girl was wide-eyed. Taking this all in, at last she said, I sure wish I'd have gotten to know you sooner. A little girl was dilig diligently pounding away on her grandfather's typewriter. She told him she was writing a story. What's it about? He asked. I don't know, she replied. I can't read. 
When my grandson asked me how old I was, I, I teasingly replied, I'm not sure. Look at your underwear, Grandpa. He advised mine says four to six. I, I want to begin today by asking you a question and, and that I really want you to think about. That what would you do if you were not afraid of anything? What would your life look like if you had no fear? You know, there used to be a, a TV program, I'm not sure it's even on anymore, but, but it was called Fear Factor. How many remember that? Well, not many. How many people know what a television? But occasionally tune it in because I, I have a certain level, I had a certain level of fascination with it. Because I, I guess I kind of like this idea of, of facing our fears. But there were certain times on that program that I just had to either turn it off or change the channel. When they started eating stuff, beetles and, 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 and slugs and bugs, I, I just can't watch that. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't even want to think about it. You know, I, I thought about putting up a clip of it so that you would know what I'm talking about, but then I realized we'd have to watch it. <laughs> and I couldn't bring myself to do that. When, when they started to eat stuff, like, like if I was a contestant on Fear Factor, I would check out right there. I would leave. I wouldn't be out of there. I don't mind diving underwater. I don't mind jumping off building. Those things look kind of fun, but I'm not going to eat that stuff. Can I say this? What are you afraid of? What, would you just mention to someone sitting by you that you're afraid of? You know, there, there's something about confession that is, that is actually good. What are you really afraid of? Just tell someone. I'm deathly afraid of... No. <laughs> well, you did pretty good. Okay, how many of you are afraid of snakes? Be honest. Okay. How about mice or, or rats or rodents? A anybody here afraid of spiders? I do not like spiders. They give me the creeps. When a spider shows up at my house, they have signed their death warrant. Now, it's what, what's interesting, darling, is I have not seen a spider in my house for months, maybe even a few years. Yeah, so, 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 so maybe Mickey, knowing how much I hate them, she takes care of them. <laughs> but if, for sure, if I see a spider, it's as good as dead. And I don't care if you think that's cruel. I don't care. Harry and Arden and I and a couple other guys were disc golfing about a week or so ago, and, and we kept throwing our discs in the rough. Now, the rough in a disc golf course is muy diferente. It's very different from the rough in a regular golf course. The rough in a regular golf course is just a section that they don't water, and they like get dry, and yeah, there's a few weeds growing in there, but they, it gets mowed. The, the rough on a disc golf course is a forest. It's, it's like a jungle. And so where I, I'm wa walking through this and, and I keep running into spider webs with my face. I, I hate that. Because I saw that movie where the giant spider comes out and eats you. Ah! Any spider that is found in my house is as good as dead. My motto is the only good spider is a dead spider. 
Now, don't get me wrong. You know, they can hang out all they want outside. They can run around my yard. I will absolutely leave them alone. But don't you come in to my house. Now, do you know what I do if I spot a spider in my house? So some of you are, are thinking, some of you are thinking, Mickey, help, help. But here's the truth. Some of them will be squashed underfoot if they're on the floor. If they're on the wall, they will be plucked with tissue paper and face a burial by sea. They are getting flushed down the toilet. Anyway. <laughs> What, what are you scared of? Anybody afraid of heights? Okay. I, I, I should probably be more afraid of heights than I am. You know, some people are afraid of water. Do you know what freaks me out? I mean, besides spiders? Being trapped in a closed place. <laughs> I, I guess they call that claustrophobia. I just don't like that feeling. I read a story about a guy that fell down a chimney. And I mean, they found him months later. He wasn't alive. But when I read that story, I tried to imagine myself. I was hit first. I tried to imagine myself head first down a chimney. I hate that thought. Unable to do anything. When I was a kid, they used to have these, this thing called, uh, parents, you might explain this to your kids, but they used to have this thing called phone booths. Back in the days of Superman. And sometimes we would try to see how many people that we could get in a phone booth. How many people can you cram into a phone booth? And I, I would be okay with doing that as long as I'm the last person in. As long as I can control when I get out. But the thought of being the first person in there with my face smashed up against the glass, not knowing when I can get out, I don't like that. You know, we all have some fears, don't we? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you love to be fearless? Wouldn't you love to be considered a fearless person? You know, that there's something inside of each one of us that would love to hear someone say this. Fear is evidently not a factor for you. We would love to believe that we have faced our fears, and we won. We have conquered them. We love courageous people. We love stories of courageous men and women. Elijah taking on the 450 prophets of Baal. Calling down fire. God's fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice. All the prophets of Baal are slain. You know, or David when he faced Goliath while all the trained Hebrew warriors are in camp, at camp shaking in their boots, this little guy says, I'll take him out. I'll do it. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway? Well, when Nikki and I were on vacation last year, we went to the movie Harriet. Now, I, I like sci-fi. This wasn't sci-fi. I like sci-fi, but I also like true stories. I, I like stories that are based on something that really happened. And so it's the story of Harriet Tubman, a, a black gal that escaped the South during the time of slavery, but she didn't just escape the South. Her courage wasn't at, just at that level. She went back and rescued others and got them out. She was a, a courageous woman. Or that time when Jonathan and his armor bearer decided to just take on the whole Philistine camp and kill every one of them. Wow. We love stories of men and women of courage. We like to watch movies like Braveheart with, with William Wallace and, and Mel Gibson with, with his face, you know, painted up. And, and they, 
what, what you doing? And he says, I'm going to pick a fight. So, is it just guys? Something inside of us stirs when we see real courage. One of the movies about a man of courage that I loved was Harrison Ford in Air Force One. And, and, you know, there's this bad guy on the plane, and he's after the president, and he's wreaking havoc, and he's taking people out. Get off my plane. 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 Maybe we can. That's my favorite three seconds in the movie. Because this, this bad guy is doing all this bad stuff, and finally it, it's the coup de grace, and Harrison Ford says, get off my plane. Kicks him right off the plane. I'm thinking, I'd vote for that president. He's got my vote. We love people of courage. But, but I want to read to you what Robert Flood wrote. And I do have an overhead for this. Deep within... We all imagine ourselves a mixture of Patrick Henry, Davy Crockett, John Wayne, and the prophet Daniel. But the truth of the matter is, rather than rugged individualists, we are more like Gulliver of old, tied down and immobilized by t tiny strands of a thing called fear. So what would you do with your life? If you weren't afraid. What, what, what would be different if you had no fear? One thing that I've been learning is my life grows in direct proportion to the amount of courage that I have. And see, one of the most courageous things that we can do and, and continue to endeavor to, to endeavor to do day after day is listen to Jesus say, follow me, and to actually follow him. Because he will take us out of our comfort zone. He will take us into places that feel risky, places of utter dependence upon him. In your notes, it takes courage for you and me to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And see, all of that allows letting certain things fall away in our life and being willing to go where he leads us. So what, what would you do with your life if you weren't afraid? And, and to be honest, that's not really the right question. It's the wrong question. Because, in your notes, courage is not an absence of fear. But it is the power to overcome it. And to press into the, the purpose and the plan of God for my life. You know, I've said a lot of stuff here to get to one verse of Scripture. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now the word means timidity or, or cowardice. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. What God has done in your life in the new birth and in the baptism with the Holy Spirit, he gives you power, dunamis power, the power of God and the love of God and, and soundness. You know, one of the greatest hindrances to moving forward often is a thing called fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the known. Fear of, uh, of the future. Fear of failure. Fear of embarrassment. Fear of humiliation. Fear of, uh, of man. Fear of what people think. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The word snare here implies captivity. Mokashi is the, is the, the Hebrew word, and it, it, it is a word that's used to describe a noose, like, like for catching animals, and by implication, a hook for the nose. 
The fear of man, the fear of what people think, brings us into captivity when we are not free in that place. Fear is, is a source of captivity. It, it is a noose to catch you and to keep you captive. It puts a ring on your nose to be led around, and we know who that means we are led around by. But see, when we trust in the Lord, yeah, he, he takes us out of our comfort zone. But you will, in that place, be free to be who he created you to be. And it's actually a safe place. There is no safer place than being smack dab in the middle of his will for your life. Fear incapacitates. Can we just say that out loud together? Fear incapacitates. It stops us from doing the things that we dream of. It's like a noose that brings us into captivity. I used to dream about sick people being healed. I used to dream about seeing miracles, but I also had a fear that, what if it didn't work? And then what would people think? It's a fear of man. And you know, I, I let that fear incapacitate me for a season of my life. It, it kept me from stepping out of my comfort zone. It kept me from stepping into the things that I was dreaming about. What do you dream about? What are your dreams? Every dream that comes from God requires risk. What, what, what dream has God given you? What stops you? Everything you want requires risk. I, I can't remember who said it, but I wrote it down when they did. They said, there's no safe place in life. You'll never get out of here alive. Now, I, I want to look at a portion of Scripture that to me is very interesting, and it addresses, I believe, some of the things that we're talking about today. Ecclesiastes 11 I really want to look at verses 4 through 6, but I'm just going to read verse 1 first. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. I, I know we've applied that verse to, to sowing financial seed, and that, that certainly applies, but there's more to it than that. Cast your bread upon the waters. What does that mean? Cast your bread, cast your life. Let, let your life be poured out on the waters of humanity. How do I apply that to my life? Verse 4 says this, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. If you're waiting for everything to line up perfectly in the natural before you step out, you will probably be waiting forever. You can spend your whole life waiting for everything to be right. Uh, if I'm waiting for perfect weather, I, I may end up not sowing a crop, or I might, might end up not harvesting the crop that I have sown. It was the year 1979, and I was about ready to go to work for Frito-Lay. I was so excited. I, I could hardly wait. My, my excitement was causing me to lose sleep at night. I was so excited. I had given my two weeks notice. I was getting ready. I was going to have a week of training for, for Frito-Lay. And I'm right in that middle place there, just excited. And someone mentioned to me, hey, did you hear? There is a potato shortage. There is an extreme potato shortage. They warned me about going to work for Frito-Lay. What good will a job be that pays on commission when there's no product to sell? But see, I believed that God had given me that job. I had been praying for a new job. A lot of people wanted that job. I had like this assurance in my heart that, that, that this was God. This was going to be good. I didn't observe the wind. I paid no attention to the clouds or the potato shortage. And in truth, I made more money that year than I have ever made prior to that in any year of my life. I was rolling in the chips, figuratively and uh, otherwise. 
God amazingly blessed that job. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. Don't wait for everything in the natural to line up. That may never happen. What are your dreams? Verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind. You know, you, you never know which way the wind is going to blow. You can guess, but you never know. You can't see the wind. It is something that is baffling. Or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. Even though that baby is growing inside the womb, you can't see the, the bones forming. It's beyond what you can observe with your natural eye. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. There is a lot that is happening around you that you can't even see. God is working behind the scenes and it's going to be good. You have to walk by faith, not by what you see. What you see may throw you what, what you see may distract you, but we are those that, that walk by faith, not by sight. We don't set our uh, affection and our focus in the natural realm. We, we have a different focus. Verse 6, in the morning, sow your seed. It doesn't matter what the weather's doing. It does, doesn't matter what's going on around you. And in, in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Continue to do the things that you are called to do. Continue to sow and reap, but don't wait for the perfect time. I went to a conference years ago in the key arena in Seattle with a friend of mine. This was the late 90s. It wasn't a Christian conference, but a few of the speakers were Christian. It was a motivational conference. Barbara Bush spoke at that conference. General Schwarzkopf spoke at that conference. Zig Ziglar was there. And, and I can't remember who said this, but I wrote it down at, at this conference, and I have it on an overhead. Make your move before you're ready. Fear of failure stops many people. Follow your heart, not your head. Leap and the net will appear. Walk by faith, not by sight. When you know that you are called to do something, you know it in your heart. God, God has breathed on it. You can't walk by sight. You must walk by faith. I've heard people say, well, I, I'm just looking for an open door to go through. That, that Any time a door opens, it must be God's will. How many know that's not true? Not every opportunity is God. Not every door that opens is God. In fact, I've had to go through doors that weren't open. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes there's warfare. Sometimes there's a battle to push through. In your notes, don't be ruled over by the external realm. Don't, don't let that control what you do and how you live. You have God living inside of you. You have the creator of the universe inside of you. You don't have to be dominated by the external realm because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Helen Keller made a statement that I want to share with you. Who knows who Helen Keller was? Good. She, she died in 1968. She was 88 years old. And see, what makes her life so interesting is that she was born deaf and blind. She never in her entire life heard, and she never in her, her entire life saw. And, and you'd think in a situation like that that she'd just be put in some home where disabled people are. And she would live out her life in that place and die. But did, did you know that she learned to talk? She was an author, a political activist, a lecturer. She was the first deaf and dumb person to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. She was amazing. 
Anyway, she said this, life is either a daring adventure or it's boring. Life is either a daring adventure, I'm on this adventure, or, you know, it's kind of boring. Now, why would she make a statement like that? I believe it's this. You were created for adventure. You were created for the adventure. It, 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 now, the adventure is outside of your comfort zone, but, but that's what you're called to. You have to have courage to overcome your fear, to step into that adventure. But who wants to live a boring life? At least I think that's what she means. One person said this, if you're not living on the edge, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up way too much space. Was it Lauren Cunningham? Good. Thank you, babe. It's not what happens outside or around us that counts. It's not what, what's going on there that's important. It's what's happening inside of you, in your heart, in mind. It's not what happens to you, but how you handle what happens to you inside. You, you've got to go after the things that God has deposited in your heart, what God has put there. You cannot be affected by, by what's going on around you. Don't be afraid to chart uncharted waters. Don't be afraid to do things that no one else is doing. Don't, don't be afraid to go where no one else is going. What, what I am talking about today is once and for all breaking the stronghold of fear off of our lives and making a choice to step into a supernatural lifestyle. See, Jesus modeled a way of living for us. He didn't just come as, as God on the earth and, and, then, and then to die for us. He came and actually a modeled a way of living so that we could follow after him. He came dependent upon the Holy Spirit. He came with a relationship with the Father, and he came with his kingdom. The, the, the kingdom of God was released through Jesus' life. That's why wherever he went, he wasn't subject to what was going on in the natural. Well, we just have a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. doesn't matter. Well, this person, sorry you, you couldn't get here soon enough, but Lazarus is dead. Move the stone. See, it doesn't matter. Now, now you can live focused on the natural realm and subject to the natural realm. But what God is calling us to do is to lift our eyes and see something greater. So that we're not focused on the temporal realm, but on the eternal realm. There, there's a verse of scripture I want to read to you that's found in, in 2 Corinthians He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen. Don't, don't let your focus, right? this is 2 Corinthians 4.18. Don't let your focus be distracted by what's around you. But at the things which are for the things which are seen are temporary, temporal, therefore changeable. But the things which are not seen are eternal. See, when Jesus walked the earth, yes, he could see what was going on in the natural realm, but he was never subject to it because he had, he had a whole kingdom. And, and he knew that as, because of the relationship he had with the Father, he could release that kingdom anytime it was needed. And see, Jesus was modeling for us a way of living. And he, he invited us into that place 
when, when he said, greater things th than I do, you will do also. Because I go to the Father, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you into this lifestyle that I have been living. God wants to break the stronghold of fear off of our lives. Millions of people all over the world are bound by the stranglehold of fear. Now, I want to use the acronym, or use fear as an acronym, and, and share the definition of fear based upon this acronym. False evidence appearing real. Fear. False evidence appearing real. What are you afraid of? In what area of your life have you maybe believed a lie from the enemy? The hold of fear is broken by exposing the lies of the enemy. The, the, the Bible is incredibly clear that God does not want us to live in fear. I haven't personally counted each one, but I've heard people say there's a, there's a, there's a promise of fear not or, or don't be afraid in one form or another over 365 times in the Bible. More than one for every day. God does not want us to live in fear. We, we read that verse of scripture earlier, 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That spirit of fear did not come from God. Intimidation does not come from God. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. But, but the truth is, many people, in fact, probably all of us at one time or another, have believed a lie from the enemy. They, they have embraced his deceptive practice of instilling fear in their heart, and instead of rejecting it, they, they embraced it. Beloved, God doesn't want you to be afraid. God sent Jesus so that we could live an abundant life. This abundant life contains no fear. It contains righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be thinking, well, fear is natural. We're supposed to be afraid of certain things. We're born with this fight or flight mechanism inside. We're supposed to have healthy fears. I'm not talking about those kinds of fears. I'm not talking about the fear of stepping out in front of a semi barreling down the highway. That, 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 some would just call that common sense. Uh, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that kind of fear will save your life. Uh, some people would just call it practical wisdom, but that's not the kind of fear I'm trying to address today. We are all to have a reverential fear of the Lord. That is a healthy respect for who God is. That kind of faith is the beginning of wisdom. That kind of faith empowers you to lead a godly life. It, that, I, I'm not talking about that kind of fear. What I am talking about is irrational fear. I am, I, I am talking about the spirit of fear, which comes from the enemy. Now, I know somebody today that is afraid to drive over a bridge. They feel like if they ever did that, the bridge would collapse and they would die. Therefore, whenever they travel, they have to plot out a way to get to their destination, wherever they might be going without having to drive over a bridge. That is called irrational that is the kind of fear I'm talking about. An irrational fear does not come from God. I know someone that is just terribly afraid of demons. They're actually tormented by that fear day and night. Demons are real, but that is an irrational fear, at least for a child of God. They have believed a lie that the enemy sold them, and they bought into it, and now it dominates and controls their life. Now, I absolutely hate fear in my life or anyone else's. 
Fear confines me. It, it restricts me. It incapacitates me. I, I sometimes do things to overcome my fears. I, I sometimes do things because I, I th I'm afraid of something, so I step into it to overcome that fear. I don't like being confined by fear. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Are you guys doing okay? This passage is talking about our warfare not after the flesh. Therefore, our weapons are not weapons of the flesh. Verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Now, that word can also be translated imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. But let me say something to you. Fear dwells in the imagination. In fact, imagination is the seat of all irrational fear. If the enemy is going to make you afraid, he is going to begin in your imagination. Fear dwells, irrational fear dwells in the imagination. That, that fear that if I cross a bridge, I'm going to die, that, that fear was planted into that person's imagination. And instead of rejecting it, they embraced it. You know, I could give you lots of other examples. <laughs> Have you ever walked by a couple people? Now, you're, you're having kind of a rough day. Maybe you're a little bit tired and stuff. And you walk by a couple people and they're talking, but they're talking very quietly, quiet, quietly, quietly. And, and, uh, and, and, and as, you, as you see them in your imagination, you begin to think you know, that they're talking about you. Well, well, they probably think this, or they, they probably think that. They're saying this about me, and they, they, they're saying that about me. And you, and you end up intimidated, afraid about what people are, are saying or thinking about you. How many know that's ridiculous? That dwells in your imagination. You have no physical evidence of that. It is a seed that the enemy has come to plant to incapacitate you. It only survives and thrives within the context of your imagination. But once you realize where fear lives, you will now know how to attack it. You will now know how to overcome it. Your imagination is, is, is a battleground for spiritual warfare. Your mind or your imagination is an arena of warfare. Now see, the enemy knows where to put things to incapacitate you. This is where he operates, creating thoughts, images, suggestions, perspectives that keep you out of God's perfect plan for your life. What is fear? False evidence appearing real. False evidence that looks real. Fear is rooted in a lie. Every area of bondage in a believer's life is connected to a lie they have believed. Every area of bondage in a believer's life is connected to a lie that they have embraced and chosen to believe. These lies are primarily about God and about them. When you understand that the enemy is a liar, when you understand that fear, irrational fear, is a lie, things will begin to change in your life. G Jesus said this about the enemy. He has no truth in him. He was a liar from the beginning. The devil is a liar. Everything he suggests is a lie. Now, this is very important to understand. The spirit of fear does not come from God. The, the word for fear, we said this in, in 2 Timothy 1.7, means timidity, cowardice. God doesn't want us to be cowards. He wants you to be bold as a lion. In fact, the book of Proverbs says that the righteous are bold as a lion. You are not a coward, my beloved. You are, you are bold as a lion. You don't have to be pushed around by the enemy. You have authority. Can I have the worship team come? And could we do that very first song that you did this morning? I'm going to have everyone stand up in a moment. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. 
Let me just talk for just a few minutes longer. When we fully understand our righteousness, it, it causes us, it causes something to well up in us. And it's, it's the boldness of God. There's a tenacity. Then there's a confidence that comes from God. There's a very big difference between, between being self-confident and being God-confident. Although they might look the same sometimes, but they're very, very different. Then, then this boldness, it enables us to, to seize divine opportunities that God gives us. The spirit of fear does not come from God. Instead, he has given you a spirit of love and of power and of soundness. Those things are from God. Fear creates an atmosphere of disempowerment. Any area of my life that I have fear in is an area where I have been disempowered. But I want to release something today. I believe God has put it on my heart so that we don't have to live in fear anymore, so that we are no longer manipulated by the enemy. God wants to break the stronghold of fear off of your life. And I believe he wants to do it today. And I know that may sound like a bold statement, but, but I believe it. God's will for you is fearlessness. God's will for you is boldness. Not you stirring it up. Not you trying to be bold. But the Spirit of God coming upon you and releasing that boldness through your life. That's who you are in Jesus Christ. So can we stand together this morning? And I just want to encourage you, just put yourself in receive mode. There's nothing you need to do for this except receive. Does that, does that make sense? I believe God has something for you today. And the only thing you need to do is receive it. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, Jehovah Shalom, a source of peace. Father, in Jesus' name, I release your power to break, to, to vanquish, destroy every form of fear in all of its manifestations. We expose you right now, devil. We expose you by the fire of God and by the supernatural force of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I declare your people free. I declare your people loosed in Jesus' name so that they are free to do everything that you have called them to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So this wasn't the song that we originally planned to end the service, but we all really felt like this was the song that's supposed to be sung. And so as we sing this, I just want you to declare this over yourself and, and claim this for yourself. And so, Lord, we just pray that any lies that we are believing, that we don't even know that we're believing, Lord, that you would just bring those down right now as we sing this song. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of delight. From my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to a family your blood flows 
of God's power over me, through me, and around me. <laughs> hey, could you, could you just read that one more time? Just one more time. Receive this. I am a child of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. I am made righteous and pure through him. I am fearless and bold because of the realization of God's power over me, through me, and around me. Thank you, Lord. The benediction I want to give you is Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ 
be with you all. Amen. God bless you, saints. Have a great, great week.